So welcome everyone. My name is Erica Benson. I'm the executive director of the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our faculty academic staff forum. I have the great pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Matt Jewell, who's a professor in the Department of Material Science and Biomedical Engineering here at UW-Eau Claire. After receiving his PhD from Madison in 2008, he spent three glorious years in the south of France at the Nuclear Fusion Project Eater before taking up his current faculty position. And I will say we are lucky to have him here. His research interests are in the metallurgy and mechanical properties of superconducting materials, which we will hear more about today. And on campus, he enjoys working with the Circa Quick Pitch Program, the Christian Faculty Network, and advising several student groups. He and his wife, Jody have four great kids, ages 15 to 20. And in his copious free time, and I raise my eyebrows at that copious sure. part, you will find him riding a bike. Um, before I turn things over to Dr. Jewell, I just want to um, let you know that we will have time for questions after the talk, questions and discussion. And for our online viewers, I encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And our wonderful graduate assistant, Matt, will read those out for us. And Dr. Jewell, just a request to you, if we do have questions from the audience, could you please just briefly repeat them for the benefit of our online viewers? Thank you. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Matt Jewell. Hey, thank you, Erica. I'm glad to be able to talk today. I, I wanted to have an opportunity to talk about this work because uh, for me, it's uh, one of the projects that I kind of enjoy most about being a faculty member here, the type of project I enjoy most, is where we get to go out and work with companies and help them kind of solve practical problems that uh, are within kind of our, uh, our field of expertise. So I'm gonna be talking today about um, superconducting magnets and uh, what superconductors are, but then also kind of uh, talk through sort of, sort of um, uh, how we try to align kind of needs of companies, industrial projects with capabilities we have here, with student interests, student capabilities, and kind of how we try to make a good research project out of all of that. Okay, so first we have to talk about superconductors a little bit. Um, superconductivity, as many of you know, is a exciting phenomenon. It allows us to carry electricity without any electrical resistance. And historically, uh, over, over the years, we've found many more in, new and interesting and better superconductors with higher and higher so-called critical temperature, TC, that can um, operate at uh, still very cold temperatures. This is in Kelvin here, but uh, uh, well above kind of the near absolute zero temperatures of, of the original superconductors discovered over 100 years ago. Okay, so uh, this is a very interesting graph, but, but to be honest with you, it's more so the physicists that are the ones out here looking for the room temperature superconductor or these very uh, high-end exotic materials that operate at high pressure or uh, with very exotic compositions. You know, we're, we're, we're engineers, we're material scientists. Uh, we are a lot more interested in how can we kind of take some of these existing materials, how can we design the structure to really maximize its unique properties and then, you know, we always have to ask, uh, what can we build with it? What, what can we make with it? Why, why is it useful? Right? That's kind of intrinsic to what we, what we do. So one of the useful things you can do as a superconductor is you can make magnets. In fact, far and away, uh, magnets are the largest uh, uh, industrial or even research-based application for superconductors. We don't really have superconducting transmission lines going across the country for a variety of practical reasons, but we have lots and lots of superconducting magnets including here at UW-Claire, not, okay, not, not this model, but uh, we, we have uh, an, an NMR, uh, I'm sorry, I, I got to did my copy paste wrong there, of course I should say NMR, uh, for uh, chemistry and medical research. Uh, we have an NMR up on the fourth floor of Phillips Hall, has a superconducting magnet in it, needs to be fed liquid helium to keep it cold. Uh, Jenny Dahl here will know that that's not a cheap uh, proposition, but uh, if you've had this, ever have your head inside an MRI, that large donut around you is also a superconducting magnet. Um, there's advanced kind of medical applications like cyclotron for proton therapy that use superconductors, as well as more uh, research-based projects like uh, nuclear fusion reactors, uh, such as the ITER project I was working on in France for magnetic confinement, and then uh, particle accelerators. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is certainly the, the largest uh, such application of superconducting magnets to bend and focus the particle beams that then get smashed together. All right, so these are kind of the, 
uh, things we think about. And because we're fundamentally trying to make, make a magnet, there's sort of one eternal driving question we are always thinking about at almost, almost the exclusion of every other question, which is how much electric current can we push through that wire uh, in order to generate as large a field as possible? So, you know, we are not actually so much thinking about how can we make that TC as high as possible. We are much more interested in how can we uh, improve its properties. Now, this is a very busy slide that I'm not going to expect you to fully parse, but I just want to say that as, as the physicists might care more about that critical temperature, we as engineers are much more interested in how much current density can we carry in the wire as a function of magnetic field, because if we're going to make a large magnet out of it, it has to work at those high fields. So this is a just kind of bevy of different um, superconductors. I think what I want you to see is that there's a handful of them that have fairly steep slopes as a function of applied field, and then there's a handful of them that have much shallower slopes. Obviously, we would rather work with these materials that have these shallower slopes that can, can be pushed to higher and higher field without losing too much of their current, cap uh, current carrying capability. Um, we'll talk about some of the challenges of doing that here in the talk today. So kind of the slightly sarcastic, but, but sort of not a uh, 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 quote from, from my PhD advisor was always that, you know, that uh, new highest ever EC value is gonna get you the Nobel Prize, but JC, the current density, that's gonna get you a real magnet. So we, we are modest people as, uh, as magnet designers, builders, as engineers, we are content to live with that. We'll leave the Nobel Prizes in superconductivity to somebody else. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about my uh, research group here before I get into the kind of main topic today. So I tend to work with a group of sort of four to six students at one time. Uh, we kind of have a variety of uh, techniques we work in for superconducting materials, mostly centered on microscopy, image analysis, AI, mechanical properties. Um, and then we try to sort of uh, apply these to categories that we call LTS and HTS. So some superconductors like navium pi, navium tin, uh, they essentially need liquid helium to be cooled, four Kelvin. And so we call those low temperature superconductors. Uh, and then we have a few more categories um, which uh, require more like liquid nitrogen that can operate at 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 Kelvin. And that's, you know, if you, uh, it's maybe not quite tongue in cheek, but we call them high temperature superconductors, just you know, means relative to these uh, materials that require helium. And these are all uh, images and materials that we've worked with here in our group. Uh, so we've done some sponsored research with uh, MRI manufacturers to help them um, uh, improve the quality of the niobium titanium that goes into their MRIs. Uh, we've worked with my uh, former organization, Eater, in France to help understand how their very large cables, this is about a two inch diameter cable that carries 68,000 amps of electricity, how it degrades as a function of magnetic cycling and how to improve it, make it more robust mechanically. The project I'm gonna talk about today uh, deals with this complex uh, bismuth-based ceramic oxide called uh, bismuth 2212. I'll come back to that. And then we also work with some manufacturers who make a tape type superconductor called Rebco that, um, that uh, uh, requires an epitaxial growth and therefore has some unique constraints requirements and we look at a variety of the mechanical properties associated with that. Okay, so we kind of stay busy across the years uh, working on these different suites of things. Of course, what we try to do is take a sort of a common set of techniques and capabilities and then apply them in different, different situations. HGS materials, they can work at these higher temperatures uh, and then have these flatter uh, profiles as a function of field. Uh, they actually have sometimes exceptionally high critical fields. Some of them can operate up to 80 or 100 Tesla. And two that are particularly interesting for applications are this bismuth 2212. It's actually bismuth strontium calcium copper oxide. That's a mouthful. So we always just say 2212. And then this um, uh, Rebco, it's uh, one of the classes there is yttrium barium copper oxide. But we substitute, we do a lot of rare earth substitutions on that first cation. So we tend to call it Rebco. What's very challenging, however, about these so called HTS materials, uh, especially in contrast to some of the LTS materials that are much better behaved in certain ways is um, they have very challenging mechanical properties, by which I mean they're brittle. Um, and uh, any large magnet is going to create large Lorentz forces. And so the brittle mechanical properties is a significant challenge there. Um, there's a second problem associated with the stored energy in these magnets. That's not really an issue that we look at so much in my group, but it's a huge challenge for making large magnets out of, out of these HTS materials. And then third one, uh, which maybe sounds a little prosaic, is actually very critical, is you have to be able to make these things in long lengths. It is not enough to make up these HTS materials in the lab and you have you know, four centimeters and you say, look at this extraordinary critical current that I generated. If you want to wind a magnet out of it, if you want to actually you know, make a wire that you can um, 
make enough loops on your magnet, uh, you're going to be able to make uh, kilometers at a time. And that's related then to the project that we'll talk, talk through today. Okay, but you know, these practical things are important. Uh, so in our group, we've been fortunate to be funded by the US Department of Energy uh, for I think 12 years now, uh, counting, just got renewed again for three years, um, to essentially work with manufacturers around the US, help them improve uh, the production of their uh, HTS materials. Um, and DOE is interested most in particle accelerator applications because that's the end goal they're looking for. So we you know, gear the projects that way, but of course there are then uh, a lot of the lessons learned are applicable for other situations. Okay, so just a slide here quickly on how do we make this particular material I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm talking about this 2212 material. Uh, because it's such a brittle uh, material mechanically, it's fundamentally a powder and tube technology. That means that we take uh, a soft ductile metallic tube, such as silver. And I'll say about silver in a second here, why that material? We fill it with a nice friable brittle powder of 2212. We draw that down, we restack it into bundles draw that down, restack those bundles into uh, something like you see here. And then we have this nice multi-filamentary wire uh, with, uh, in this case, hundreds, in some other cases, thousands of superconducting filaments. We perform a heat treatment to um, then sinter those together. And in fact, it's even partially melts, so we get a little bit of texturing from the melting. And now we have these continuous elements that are each carrying the supercurrent. All right, so this superconductor working uh, depends on having these small, irregular, brittle powder-based filaments that can now you know, go along continuously for a kilometer uh, without, without breaking. That, that is what we are trying to achieve. That is not an easy, that is not an easy task. That, that is a large ask. Then we are also making the matrix, uh, the metal matrix here out of silver, uh, because we need that for oxygen diffusion. Very hard to find a material that has the mechanical properties we need and the oxygen diffusion characteristics we need for the heat treatment other than silver, uh, so that is not cheap. Uh, so then you also, you, you definitely need this material to carry as much current as possible because you want to manufacture as little of it as possible because uh, you don't want to become Fort Knox here. Okay, so that's kind of the context. So we, we now in this project are trying to uh, help a manufacturer improve the sort of homogeneity of those filaments uh, and develop some techniques to help them understand the characterization, how to characterize those filaments so that we can get as much current density out as possible. Okay, so to say a little bit more about that, um, what we've uh, seen, what we've learned, uh, is that really in the past kind of six or seven or eight years, there's actually been very little advancement in the current carrying capability of this 2212 material. Uh, and that's really because, to make a complicated story short, it's a very complicated combination of architecture, the characteristics of powder, the billet processing, the heat treatment, all those things. And you, know, you get a good billet, a bad billet, it's not so easy to sort of suss out, to pull out which variable is really contributing to that. Um, so part of the goal of this project is to help us um, do that, develop techniques to let us separate these variables and figure out which ones are most important. All right, second, it's also um, not entirely clear, but interesting to note that uh, you know, this idea of filament homogeneity, how uniform are these filaments, there is some evidence that they are actually really important for this overall performance JC. Uh, here are two different uh, 2212 powder manufacturers, NGMAT and Nexans. This um, y-axis, relative standard deviation, this is the spread in the JC performance. So this Nexans uh, wire, which uh, had in general poor powder characteristics, wide variety of particle sizes, all of that, uh, has a much greater spread in its JC values than just does, does the NGMAT. And you can see at least at low field, a, uh, even the NGMAT is well above a more well-behaved, low-temperature material like niobium titanium. So as you get to high field, the niobium pi JC gets very low. So then uh, essentially this bumps up because of the size of the denominator. But um, at, at low field, you can see we still have a long way to go, right? The, it's kind of a factor two or more um, probably that we could improve if we knew, if we uh, could improve the manufacturing. So that's just to say, we think there's real you know, promise here. Okay, so here's our approach. Um, what we're doing is we're taking uh, green wire, so that's 2212 wire in its final size, but before it's been heat treated, and we are going to characterize the filament homogeneity uh, of the overall pack, of the bundles, and of individual filaments um, as a function of many variables, but I'll talk mostly today about uh, the size or the area of those filaments and their circularity, uh, their shape, essentially. And we do this through a uh, uh, um, sequential polishing process where we, we image it, we grind and polish and put it back on the microscope. 
image it again, do it again and again, and then through some clever image analysis techniques that the students developed in the group, uh, we can actually see how individual filaments are morphing and changing along the length. All right, and you might say, well, look, you're only grinding a millimeter at a time here. That doesn't seem like you're going you know, very far. How much are the filaments really changing? But keep in mind, these filaments are 10 or 15 or 20 microns in diameter. So if you think about an L over D ratio, we're doing something like an L over D of 100. So for an individual filament, that is a long length for the filament. Um, and now we're looking over several, several of those to kind of see how it's uh, varying. And then um, for whatever parameter we're interested in, whether that's area, circularity, other things, we calculate the coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation in that parameter divided by the average. And we're kind of using that as our primary performance metric. So higher COV values would be bad, lower COV values would be good. I don't expect you to know all the details of all the samples we looked at, but let's just say we have a we got we were able to get a very robust set of samples uh, thanks to a relationship with a manufacturer out in New Jersey who makes these. So several different architectures. You can see different numbers of filaments and bundles in the cross section. That's important. Uh, different powder suppliers inside those materials. Uh, some size variation in the diameter, not as much. Then we do a short, uh, what we call pre-densification, just a little heat treatment to make sure that those powders are uh, densified, consolidated, and we'll get good, uh, good metallography on them. And then we do our analysis. I'm gonna show you the results, but first just uh, one word on kind of why this is a good project for undergrads. And I think this is really key, this is really critical here, right? To be clear, we wanna be doing work that is uh, important to the community and is relevant for our research, our professional development, but it's also important to have projects that are well aligned so we can get students involved and have them working. So for me, this is a project that really hits um, several things. Uh, we have enough discrete tasks that I can give a piece of it to one student and they can sort of do those things in series, or we can break the project up and have multiple students working in parallel. All right, so there's enough different, different pieces there that that works. Um, there's relatively easy kind of scaffolding of skills. We can, we can start a new student out on one piece of the project, maybe that's the metallography, you know, polishing the samples that uh, is not always the most fun part of the project, but this is a very important one. Um, and you can kind of build up from there into some of the imaging, image analysis, other tasks. I also think this is a really great project because it really sort of takes all these pieces that we would think of in the typical kind of, you know, scientific process, or if you think about going to grad school someday, it's got a significant experimental component, there's an analytical component, there's some computational needs. You can really kind of start to diversify your skill set and, and show how you grow in those different areas as a, a student. And then, you know, I, I really try to pick projects that where I don't have a full necessarily map in my head of where the project's gonna go. So in this case in particular, as it relates to, you know, how are we gonna identify and track these filaments? Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't have an obvious solution there, right? So I, I gave that to the students. I said, we're, we're gonna you know, figure this out. And a couple of students in particular really uh, put that on and made some significant intellectual contributions to help solve that. Um, and so that's helped. And then also important for student project, plenty of samples for us to look at. No, no shortage of work. So uh, there's always, always a sample to be um, analyzed or, or polished or imaged. So let me try to say a little bit what we found. Um, so what we did is looking across this set of 12 samples. So the 12 dots here are the 12 different samples we looked at. We plotted them as a function of their average filament size. That's the x-axis. And then the y-axis is the coefficient of variation of that parameter of the area. And so the significant finding here is that uh, larger filaments have lower coefficient of variation. Right? Not entirely surprising, perhaps. Uh, essentially, that the, uh, the bigger the filament starts, the more uniform it can stay as it goes uh, down the length. Um, it's a good finding, but what we can do here is we can actually quantify that now, right? So if, if a supplier, if a manufacturer uh, wants to try to reduce this area variation effect, which often goes by the name sausaging, right? Filaments getting bigger and smaller as it goes down. If they want to reduce the sausaging, uh, uh, they can, we can actually now quantify for them how much of an improvement it's going to have. And so they can make an engineering decision trade-off on whether that's advantageous, whether that's worth you know, the potential change in their process to make that go. The other thing we can do, because each one of these dots is an average value that contains hundreds or thousands of filaments in it, uh, we can then take each of those filaments, plot their distribution of COVs, um, and look at the shape of the curve to see whether we have a nice sort of you know, normal or Gaussian distribution or whether we have kind of uh, tails. And you can also then uh, quantify the skew. Skew is a kind of uh, statistical parameter that we can generate off of these. But um, yeah, I think you can see visually the materials, the wires made with this NGMAP powder. This is you know, not quite a symmetrical distribution, but it's getting pretty close. Whereas this Nexans uh, definitely has more of a tail out here to the high end. And that's, that's the bad tail we want to avoid. High COV, again, is bad. That means a lot of filament sausaging. These are filaments that basically are going to drop out. 
they're not going to be participating uh, very well in carrying supercurrent. Uh, we're not getting good bang for our buck from those. All right. So, um, you know, through this relatively simple metal graphic technique, essentially, we can not only give some design guidance to the manufacturer, but we can also help uh, them to make uh, decisions about their sourcing of their, of their powder for the wire. We can go through to a similar um, analysis with the circularity. So circularity is a shape parameter that compares uh, perimeter with area. So uh, you know, essentially how circular is it? Circularity of one would be a perfect circle. Circularity of zero would be, I don't know, a straight line or something with no area. Um, we can measure that, plot it up, again, compare it to the COV. And you see a similar trend. It's not quite as strong, more scatter in the data. Um, but uh, again, the more, if you can start the filaments more circular, which means from a manufacturing point of view, a little more time and effort in TLC in building that billet and that restack to start with, uh, you can now quantify the payoff. Uh, so we can now say, this is how much it's gonna benefit you, uh, if you if you do that. And you can potentially know for a billet now from the start, because of course, you know, this axis requires you to do sort of our technique, these multiple polishings, you know, all this kind of work to all this imaging. But this value, you can get from one sample, right? You take a cross section in the lab, uh, get the average circularity through an image analysis program, and so you know where you sit here. So you can know from the start whether you have uh, a billet, a wire that's gonna be uh, in good shape or, or less good shape here. Okay, and then we can do a similar sort of analysis on the powder then, um, and uh, it's not quite as strong, but you can still see the tail on the next end's powder here, so similar uh, similar effect of the of the powder source. Here's point a little bit more on that. So the powder source certainly uh, matters, as I just said, but actually what's very interesting is that um, if you really look across all 12 wires, you sort of see the different powder manufacturers uh, behaving differently across the whole spectrum. So while powder source may be important, it's certainly not the smoking gun of, oh, this, this manufacturer is just plain good and this one is bad. Uh, instead, it's clear to me that the uh, it's really the, the manufacturing, it's the design choices when you make the billet and the quality of the billet processing, they're gonna for the most part determine uh, uh, the overall COV you get. So um, but the point here I think is to say that not only can we sort of quantify these effects, we can sort of rank them then and talk about which ones are sort of more important and which are, are less important. Okay, and then also let's identify. So I think we can say then that the powder then is something that really needs a lot more work yet. And in fact, I think since we started doing this work, we've seen some other proposals from other groups getting launched and I'll try to better understand the powder effect here because um, you know, realizing that it's kind of where maybe some of the um, still nuances that isn't fully fully understood. Okay, uh, once you've got a data set, you can do a lot of analysis with it. Um, so we have a lot of data and we try to find some relevant, interesting things to do. One of the things we wanna do is compare um, our technique, which I'm gonna call a longitudinal coefficient of variation, looking down the length of the wire, with what we may call a transverse coefficient of variation, which is just, let's look within one cross section and look at the variation among the filaments we see there. And again, this gets back to sort of, we developed this technique, but it's a pretty time intensive technique. So if we wanna sort of have other people doing it, we wanna try to simplify it to the extent possible. So here we're trying to show, you know, if all you're able to do is take one single cross section uh, in transverse, what, what can you know or guess or intuit about the longitudinal variation? And um, so here we're again plotting areas and circularities. And now we're plotting the transverse COV against the longitudinal COV. And you see for area, there is quite good uh, matching, quite good agreement, uh, good correlation between those two variables. The sort of uh, darker gray box here is the 95% confidence interval on the slope of that line. So you know we have, we have strong confidence that uh, there, there, there's a genuine relationship here between these two variables, which means that, again, if you now can just do this simpler characterization on the transverse COV, uh, you can learn something or intuit something about what's happening longitudinally. For uh, circularity, there's less uh, less of a good match. You can see there's a lot of uh, scatter there. Okay, and the last thing uh, we did is, um, I told you that this 2 to one material is sort of more advanced, newer material, you know, higher properties, uh, future application, but we're not really making magnets with it yet. It's, it's still under development. Um, but we do have some materials out there in the LPS region where we do make lots and lots of magnets out of them, and there are not kilograms, but tons, and not just kilometers, but thousands of kilometers, I guess, uh, every year of material made. I was trying to think what's bigger than kilo. Me mega, me mega meters? That sounds strange. Okay, so we said, you know what, let's, let's compare our samples with something that's more established. I mean, we know has a relatively mature manufacturing process. And so we went back and grabbed a LTS material, uh, Niven 310. This is also a powder and tube type material. Uh, some, some details or nuances here, the 
the layer that's going to be the superconductor is the ring, it's the annulus around the powder core, um, but but still has sort of the similar geometry, let's say, a little bit larger filaments as well, but overall a good comparison. And to kind of cut to the chase on it, um, if you compare, so I have uh, um, circularities in blue and areas in red here. So if you compare, uh, let's take the red first, the Nivium 10 compared to the 2212, again, remember, high COV is bad. So the Nivium 10 has a lower coefficients of variation by at least a factor two, maybe factor three, right? Uh, circularities as well. So this, again, sort of quantifies for us, like, this is how much improvement we could gain if, if we put a little more effort into the manufacturing process. Um, and that might come at a cost, right? Then it's not to say that uh, there's not trade-offs here, but uh, we can we can quantify what they are, and we can say, here's how much better we think we can get. We, we are unlikely to ever get better than this. Right, so um, whatever the effect on the JC is going to be from that reduction, that's that's how much you can how much you can achieve. Okay, this is my last slide. I'm happy to take some questions. So uh, I think some main points we would say here. So these larger and more circular filaments are more uniform longitudinally in this bismuth two two one two material. You would have maybe you know, if you'd asked me to uh, guess at that in advance, I maybe would have said that'd be my intuition. But now we've quantified it, we demonstrated it, you know, and can kind of feed that back as a as a uh, design parameter. Um, uh, I think there's a lot to say here, just essentially this filament homogeneity, really just one component of overall build performance. There's a lot of other variables, but now we have a tool where we can really uh, help to separate those, those variables. We can, we can help to say how much of the performance variation we're seeing in the final wire is because of this effect as opposed to others. Um, and of course, then we can just kind of walk the wire production over time and we can uh, give feedback to the, our, our community uh, to say whether wire production is improving or not or as a function of time. Okay, and uh, then clearly that we have some room to grow yet with uh, relative to Fabium 10. Okay, so we're grateful to the Department of Energy for, for funding this. Um, uh, as well here at UW Claire, we have a fantastic set of facilities for the Material Science Engineering Center without which uh, this entire project would not be uh, possible. So that's been a critical resource for us. Um, and then there's a, a disciplinary group uh, within the national labs called Connector Procurement Research and Development that helped us to uh, secure all these wires of different kinds and styles to do. So we're grateful to them as well. And I think I'll stop there. You mentioned, um, I think, AI as one of the techniques that you're using. So I'm curious about where that plays into the uh, Yeah, uh, Karen asked about AI. So this particular project is relatively well-behaved in that, by which I mean, we can, with fairly traditional image analysis techniques, we can threshold these images into black and white. You know, white is the filament, black is the matrix. And so this project really doesn't sort of need AI. It's not to say you couldn't do it. But 2212, I think I have a picture earlier. This is the green wire before heat treatment. Once you heat treat it, this is not very large resolution. Once you heat treat it, these filaments start to grow together. And that is also a source of variation in their performance. And so we do have a parallel project going on, and I'm just not talking about today, where we have developed a deep learning model to sort of quantify that extent of filament joining in the 2212. So that again, instead of just sort of looking at it and saying, mm, that looks bad, mm, that one looks better, we can say sort of how, how good or bad it is and then compare it to all these other parameters. Uh, so that's more, this is the sort of thing that, uh, I'm looking at my students. Have any of you had to color 2212 filaments for joining? Isabella has, okay. The, the, that is a, can be a very tedious task. So that is exactly the sort of thing where we'd rather train a tool to do that and then um, and then use the data in whatever way we, we want to. Yeah, so that's one way. So we, we see within these multi-filamentary superconductors, we see AI, um, for the most part, uh, being a tool to use on complex structures that typically require a lot of human intuition to interpret, right? That's kind of where we try to focus our AI efforts. There's probably another opportunity, and we have a, a capstone student this year exploring it, trying to relate uh, materials type parameters with more machine or uh, magnet performance parameters and trying to, you know, where you have now very large data sets and you're not trying, maybe trying to find correlations that wouldn't be obvious or that we wouldn't necessarily plot against each other just based on their intuition. So that's kind of the second way that we're exploring that as well. Yeah, but, uh, along the lines of the imaging, uh, so with the circularity, is that the comparison of like a major and a minor axis, like how consistent they are with each other? No, there, there are a variety of shape parameters. Uh -huh that we could have picked. Here we go. There's lots of shape, there's lots of ways to think about filament shape. So indeed something like aspect ratio would compare kind of major and minor axis and you know that, and that's an important parameter. 
Um, there are parameters for concavity, you know, how much of the perimeter is convex versus concave, lots of ways to get at it. We like circularity because, uh, uh, don't quote me on the equation, there's a four and a pi in there somewhere, but it's essentially perimeter divided by area uh, with some kind of a perimeter squared to area because there, it's unitless. Um, and you're essentially, uh, you know, able to capture if you have a lot of either uh, let's say small scale variation, so little wiggles, that'll show up in the perimeter, as well as larger variations, if you, you know, if, if you collapse the side of this in and turn this into a crescent shape, that'll show up in the area, right? So it allows us to capture both small scale variation and larger scale variation in the same parameter. So we like it from that uh, perspective. But indeed, you could sit for a long time and think about eight different shape parameters and which one maybe is the best for, for either this job or another one. Oh yeah, and, and I've used that with nanoparticles, right? Yeah, right. So if they pile up on each other, right. it looks like something that's not circular. So I use that to toss out yeah. the bad samples. Yeah, yeah. Also, I'm noticing now that you have this this uh, image up. So it looks like you do have some clear improvements in the circularity with increased grinding. Uh, and I think that's just random or luck yeah, in this case. Yeah, things. we just we just picked one and did it. We we did not see any consistent trend like that. Just annealing change that for you? Um, the heat treatment does, well, actually, Anne is doing this right now. We are, uh, we do this short, what's called free densification heat treatment. Here it is. So we uh, heat treat this at 830 Celsius for 12 hours. And that just kind of impacts and we feel like gives us um, more consistent result when we polish. So we don't have polishing variation showing up in the results. But Anne now is working on trying to do that without the free heat treatment to uh, say, well, just, just how much worse is it? Or you know, do we see a COV increase without that? Beyond this, the next step would really just be to go to more this full partial melt heat treatment. And that kind of destroys the discrete filamentary structure completely. So I don't know if there's a good in between otherwise. So three, Matt, you talked about um, why this is a good project for students. Could you say more about what you look for in students to join your lab? Yeah, I realize I've not been repeating the question as Erica asked me to. So uh, Erica just asked uh, kind of what do we look for students to join the uh, join the work. Um, so uh, certainly we we love having students who are just sort of you know intrinsically brilliant and can work completely on their own, and that's that's wonderful. We we I think we've done done well for those students. But uh, I think because of the sort of scaffolding of skills I talked about here, um, I think this project is also great for students who are kind of you know starting to find their way in research. And I won't. Uh, Got any current students? I'll talk about students from a decade ago. Uh, I had a, had a student in the group uh, named Nick. Uh, he now works up at uh, Berry Plastics in Chippewa Falls, and um, you know he—I don't think you mind me saying when he when he started as a freshman, maybe would not have struck you as this is our top student in the program, and you know um, uh, whatever. But but you know Nick really through getting involved in the research. You know I think I think the research helped him to start to organize his thinking about how to do projects, how to do work, right? What kind of tasks are helpful and necessary. And so I feel like there's enough structure in these projects that um, uh, it can also help students kind of build that uh, for themselves. So really at the end of the day, you just gotta wanna do the work. You, you have to want, you, you have to enjoy it. You have to want to get in the lab and be curious. And uh, when something's not working right, to overcome it and to try to find a different solution and be willing to pursue it, not just, you know, oh, that, that was weird, you know, ignore it and go on the next thing. To really kind of say what what is this you know uh, what's what's going on here right so I think it's really that kind of curiosity that I think is most most important and then I think we can sort of scale the projects in a variety of ways for students at different levels or let's say students at different goals right for where they want to get with the research. Dr. Joel, another one. Right.